What experiences have you had with language? My grandfather grew up in a German-speaking household until World War I. There are a lot of Sanseis I know who speak English only. This is part of our history that we shouldn't forget about. We took a lot of time and started to really think about things like what are other cultures, what are dialects within other cultures. So I want to ask, what does having such a diverse and multicultural background mean to you? We want to engage with the diversity and bring people together. I love you in Latvian, es tevi milu, and I taught my kids how to say it, and Super it cute. like warms your heart when it's like, es tevi milu. We live in a society where many different languages and dialects are spoken. What does this linguistic diversity mean to you? Hello, my name is Reiko Kataoka. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Linguistics and Language Development at San Jose State University. This is the video documentary of the interviews that our students had with three community organizations in San Jose. These interviews are part of the project, The Meaning of Linguistic Diversity, which was funded by the College of Humanities and the Arts with its Artistic Excellence Programming Grant. For the first interview, we visited the School of Visual Philosophy. The interviewer is Michael Krumenaka. The interviewee is Dana Harris Seeger and Yori Seeger. Hi, Dana. Hi, Yori. Thank you for having me here today. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. What can you tell us about your organization? So we are the School of Visual Philosophy. We are an art studio and school. So we do classes, we do events, we have printmaking facilities and painting and blacksmithing and metal casting. It's kind of like a Disneyland for artists, but what we really try to do is get artists to allow themselves to be professional and make a living at it and to understand that art is nothing more than a language. It doesn't necessarily have to go into a gallery or on a pedestal. It's a method of communicating. You were talking about accents before and how even if you have a bunch of sculptors in one room, mm -hmm. you all have your own accent. It's the way that you touch mm -hmm. the clay or move the material. It's that relationship that you have with it. I watched the, the video that you had on YouTube. Yeah. Uh -huh. And one of the messages that I came across was that art can vary yeah. from culture to culture. Oh, yeah, yeah big time. Something as fundamental as a painting it can vary yeah. completely in you know so many, many different ways. ways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because of the way yeah, yeah because of the way they decide to portray yeah. shapes yeah. and colors. Shapes and, and colors. You know, certain like take the color yellow for instance. In some cultures, it stands for like cowardice or shame. Some colors it stands for warning. Some are cultures that stands for loyalty. It took me even going through graduate school and being a professional artist to realize that. My story is unique, my, you know, my hand, my artwork is just a part of me and like if I'm going to get comfortable telling my story, I have to own that story, I have to know what I'm saying. We took a lot of time and started to really think about things like what are other cultures, what are dialects within other cultures. We started off talking about the variety, the dialects, the differences yeah. in art. I would like to tie that to language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What experiences have you had with language? I grew up in California, where I was told I didn't have an accent, which is silly, because everyone does. And um, then I moved to Indiana when I was 12, mm -hmm. which is the mid in the Midwest of the United States. So that's like a completely different, I was culture shock. Growing up in high school, I lived with my grandpa, mm -hmm. or he lived with us, I guess, with my family, and he uh, was from Latvia, so he his native um, language was Latvian and my grandmother's was Estonian and so they actually they met during World War II and they spoke German together because that was their common language so when I was in high school for my Latvian grandfather I wanted to learn a language he didn't really want to teach me Latvian because he said no one speaks that but I'll teach you German <laughs> so I remember having these me and my twin sister would have sort of after dinner lesson German lessons with my grandpa and that still like the lang my go-to language, it was my second language, and so when I even try to learn a new language, it's like default to German. But being Latvian and Estonian culturally, I consider myself second generation American. I am now a Latvian citizen, a dual citizen, and I'm learning Latvian, mm -hmm. which is totally different. Since you know you have experience with Norwegian, Italian, Estonian, yeah, Latvian, and German, for you guys. 
what is one of your you know mo favorite mm. words or phrases mm -hmm. from it can be from any of dialect or language yeah. and, then, and why is it important for you guys i embracing my latvian heritage uh, learned how to say i love you in latvian estevimilu and I taught my kids how to say it, and Super it cute. like warms your heart where they're just like, I you know, and they're trying really hard. So right now, that's my favorite. Yeah. I overuse uh, cheers, but it's a, it's a simple word that everybody gets, and when you use out of context where you're not drinking, but you, you know, you just tell somebody cheers, mm -hmm. for some reason, they stop and they pay attention and it brightens their, their moment. But yeah, I think that's my favorite word. So as you guys know, we live in a, a diverse community. Yeah. We have people that have different cultural, ethno-racial, and linguistic identities. Yeah. What does linguistic diversity mean for you guys? Yeah, that's a good question. I think for me it goes back to stories and owning your own story. I think one of the reasons why in our time and place we're talking a lot about uh, equity and diversity is there's a lot of conflict. Uh, and I, I also think that m most conflict probably comes from miscommunication. When we are speaking to people who maybe don't have uh, the same mother tongue and they're talking to each other, I think it's really important to take a step back and understand that language is nothing more than method communication. And it takes practice to communicate with each other and it takes time to get ideas from one point to the other. I think linguistic diversity within art is, uh, is a topic that we're now just breaching. But art being such a great language for recording history or finding out what's really important to a culture and mm -hmm. really being that mother tongue of all cultures in a way um, is a really fascinating thing to study and understand and also to be aware that your or our, my method of speaking that language is just mine and my mm -hmm. culture. It's yeah. not somebody else's. Thinking about linguistic diversity, you know, and you were talking about the languages on the buses and at San Jose State, and sometimes for me it's like I don't, I don't know if I feel jealous or something, but like I'm, I'm thinking, well, why isn't Latvian and Estonian like listed mm -hmm. on there? You know, why don't they translate? Well, who chooses these languages mm -hmm. and who decides like these are the major ones that need to be represented? I would say that the more we can let people embrace their own cultures and identities and their own pockets of you know, diversity, then the more we will be able to accept that. So one thing we've been talking about doing is, is understanding kind of what we're talking about. We have had ideas of making sure that we, we host classes in, in methods that we will not be able to do. And then bring somebody from a different culture and somebody from a different culture and have that be you know, a program unto itself where it's just exploring these different ways and giving everybody an opportunity to come and say, this is the language that I speak in, mm -hmm. in art. This is my dialect yeah. in art. This is my culture. I'd like to share it with you. And I think that would be a really fun conclusion to yeah. this idea. Well, thank you for having me here today. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It was a, yeah. it was it was a nice fun. interview. <laughs> nice to meet you. It was a pleasure to talk yeah, to you. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Dana. Yeah. So is English your mother tongue or is it? Spanish. Spanish is not good. For the second interview, we visited the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. The interviewer is Gina Trang. The interviewees are Linda Gomi and Chris Hioki. Hi Linda, hi Chris. Thank you for having me here today for this interview. So the Japanese American Museum of San Jose, or we say JAMS for short, grew out of a farming research project. From that project, grew to tell the stories of Japanese immigrants in this area. The mission of the museum is to collect, preserve, and share the history, culture, and art of Japanese Americans. The museum has been around for 35 years. Uh, we started out as the Japanese American Resource Center. So one of the main reasons for the existence of the museum is we would like to uh, prevent the unlawful incarcerations of any American citizens in the future. This is all very interesting and thank you for sharing with us your history, especially the role that the museum plays in educating the public of preventing this dark history happening again. Now with the current role that the museum plays, would you mind telling us the important role that the museum plays in the city of San Jose? 
It plays a very important role being located here in Japantown. Prior to World War II, there were more than 40 Japantowns across California. Now, there are only three. And of those three, San Jose is the only one that's in the same place. The others were relocated after the war. So being here in the community is very important. That's a, a great point, Linda. So being in Japantown, is it allows us to keep the rich history of San Jose Japantown alive. Thank you for sharing with us the history and the significant role that the museum plays in the community. Now, thinking of the current role that the museum plays, can you share with us any specific exhibits that you're focusing on? Yeah, we've got a great exhibit. You want to come see our barracks? Yeah. This is the barrack exhibit. This exhibit was built using the actual army blueprints from the Thule Lake Relocation Center. We're standing in the same space that 120,000 internees lived in during World War II. These barracks were built by Jimmy Yamaichi, and Jimmy was one of the four founders. The other founders were Kenny Wagaki, Eichi Sakawe, and Gary Okahiro. One of the things about this museum is a lot of the visitors are actual incarcerees, and to see them when they come in and, and see the museum, it, it's very touching and very moving to them. It brings back a lot of experiences. As a visitor, you can definitely feel the experience of those who were incarcerated, and this is part of our history that we shouldn't forget about. Language is personal, so I hope you don't mind me asking you a personal question. No problem. What would be your linguistic backgrounds? So, in school, I studied German, French, and Spanish. I grew up in the South, in, in St. Louis, Missouri, so among my friends, we had some Southern expressions that we used. And I lived in Japan and used Japanese. So you're very multilingual. So how do you incorporate that using Japanese in your daily life, and what does it mean to you? So my children were both born in Japan, and it was very important for my husband and I to model being a person who speaks multiple languages. Our children come from two cultures that are monolingual, which is not the norm in the world, but makes it very difficult to have two cultures that don't expect you to speak other languages. So it was important for our children to see us speaking multiple languages. I'm Sansei, and Sansei is a third generation Japanese, but I only speak English. About the third and fourth grade is I was I'm going to say forced to go to Japanese school, but I went with all my friends and, you know, all my buddies, and we just didn't really study very much, so I didn't learn a lot of Japanese, and so that, you know, I, right now I only speak English. Third generation Japanese don't speak Japanese? There are a lot of Sanseis I know who speak English only. Now, as uh, board members of the museum, what are your views on linguistic diversity? So, like, does the museum promote linguistic diversity in the community. We worked with a cloud-based service during the pandemic so that you can use your phone and scan a QR code and get a translation of some of the placards, the explanations of exhibits in the museum. We have tours in Japanese as well as in English, and we're currently working on a project to have a tour in sign language. Would you like to share with us your favorite word or phrase and why it is your favorite word or phrase? My grandfather grew up in a German-speaking household until World War I, when his family stopped speaking German. As an adult, he relearned German, and he loved to share some of the things that he was learning. One phrase that made a huge impact on me was the phrase Feinschmacher. He said that to be called a fine schmucker, you had to eat three bites of each food on your plate. Even if you knew you didn't like that food, you had to try it again. So fine schmucker became more of a life philosophy. You were a person who tried things. You were open-minded was what it finally came to mean to me. And I taught my children to be fine schmuckers as well. And so my grandfather kind of lives on through that word and phrase. The phrase that sticks with me a lot is she caught the and I. And Shikata Ganai uh, translates to it cannot be helped. This was what a lot of the internees used when they were incarcerated. 
just to keep them going. You know, it cannot be helped. My parents used to always use that phrase with me, especially when I got, you know, a little whiny. If something didn't work and be complaining, is they would always say, Shikata Ganai, just kind of go through it. It kind of sank into me. I, I kept hearing it a lot after I started volunteering at the museum. People would, would say that and it came back. I realized that there's now there's just so many things that, you know, it's, that's the way it is, you just move on. So I find myself always going back to that phrase, you know, Shikata Ganai. So thank you for sharing with us the history of your museum, the significant role that the museum plays, and your personal stories with language. We surely learned a lot today and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much. Our last interview took place in the San Jose State University campus. The interviewer is Rosa Lin. The interviewee is Priya Das of Mosaic America. Hi Priya. Thank you so much for lending us some of your time today for our interview. To start off, could you tell us a little bit more about your organization? So I'm the co-founder of Mosaic America, and what we do is uh, bridge building. We build communities by building belonging. And essentially what we do is welcome every culture that has made its home in San Jose to come share and participate and co-create cultural expressions. And so in the last few years, Mosaic America has worked with uh, 30 plus different cultures, participated with 10,000 different people across many different events across Silicon Valley. That's really great. Um, why do you think it's important to use art as a medium? We are all so used to labels, right? I am an Indian American, you are a student, and yes, these labels make us feel safe, but some of the times these labels are actually what keeps all of us apart, right? The heart of our programming is what Martin Luther King Jr. said, which is that we may have come on different ships, but we are all in the same boat now. And so when we are trying to portray an idea that community must transcend label, the community must belong to place, then we need a bold language, right? The, a language that will cut across all barriers, and that is art, right? And so when an artist, you know, uses ancient rhythms, contemporary melodies to portray their culture, that is echoed in many different cultures because essentially the human experience, such as joy at births and weddings, sorrow at death and separation. All of us humans experience it in the same way, which is why we felt that art is the most important language that we have to use. Your perspective really resonates with us. In San Jose, there are many languages that are spoken that aren't English. How does this multilingual environment inspire your group's performance? This diversity, this multilingual environment is the sole reason for our existence. How do you bring people together when they speak so many different languages. And that kind of goes back to why we use art as a way of bringing people together. Diversity is usually used as a way to separate, as a way to highlight differences. Very rarely is diversity used as a, an opportunity to learn or an opportunity to include. And that's exactly what Mosaic America does. We want to engage with the diversity and bring people together. If you don't mind, do you think you could share a little bit about your own linguistic background? I grew up in India. Mm -hmm. I come from a community that is supposed to have come to India from the north many, many, many generations ago. And the language that we speak is actually a dialect. We have no script and it's called Konkani. Going to school in a state called Maharashtra, I had to learn the state language, which is Marathi. And then we had to learn the national language, which is Hindi. And then I got married, and my husband's uh, side of my the family speaks Sileti, which is a dialect of Bengali. Um, Sileti is now uh, spoken in what is now Bangladesh. Um, I learned uh, classical vocal from a uh, region where the dominant language is Kannada. I learned dance uh, from a culture whose dominant language is Tamil. Uh, dance is one of my favorite things to learn about when it comes to sharing cultures. So you said the dance you learned is from a cultural tradition that predominantly speaks Tamil? Yes, it's from South India and it's called Bharatanatyam. And uh, since I didn't know Tamil, I had to get every poem translated. Uh, but that's the fun of it, mm -hmm. right? And uh, here, let me show you something.
So what I just did in Bharatanatyam was mm -hmm. that you and I and all of us are happy when we are together. Wow. Right? And so that's the whole point of dance, of movement, mm -hmm. of poetry, that it brings together humans um, based on common human experiences. So I want to ask, what does having such a diverse and multicultural background mean to you? You know, Rosa, I cannot imagine not knowing, uh, you know, the, all these languages that I do know. And I truly believe that once you understand the language of a person, uh, or the very fact that they speak a different language, means you are honoring that, yes, they are an individual, that they have their own history, own identity, and own culture. So in that sense, it's very important. Uh, but also at times when I'm stressed, you know, turn on the radio and I listen to a, a station that I don't understand the language. And so I just let myself float on the music um, that is unfamiliar because the rise and ebb of the vocals is enough of a human connection for me. Yeah, indeed. I think sometimes it's important to pay less attention to what sets us apart and more to what brings us together. And I think music is a really great reminder of that. Oh, absolutely. So for our last question, we'd love to know, what is your favorite word or phrase and why it might be significant to you? Let me <laughs> go back to my <laughs> roots, right. that my mother tongue, Konkani. It goes like this, Hoon Utka Ghotu. And what that means is, literally, it means I've taken a gulp of really hot water, right? And so it's in your throat. And you can't spit it out because it's too far down. And then you're afraid to swallow it <laughs> because you don't know what <laughs> it's going to do. Right? So literally, you're stuck or you don't know what's going to happen next or you don't know, you know the, what the unintended consequences of, of your actions are. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's been an honor learning about Mosaic America and your visions and your projects have been very inspiring. Oh, thank you, Rosa. The pleasure is all mine. We certainly learned a lot from these interviews. We learned how languages and dialects are part of our identities and heritages, and how each of us contributes to the colorful linguistic and cultural landscape of our society. We are yet to find out what range of experiences and perspectives our community members have. But one thing for sure is that we are learning more reasons to value our languages and dialects and to speak our mind freely in our own unique accents. I hope this dialogue continues. Surely learned a lot today, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Oh, thank you, Rosa. The pleasure is all mine. Well, thank you for having me here today. Yeah, it was a nice interview. Nice to meet you. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Michael.